one of the things that I hadn't really expected to chat about much, but became a subject of like kind of a lot of conversation in the longer interview with Stephen and Emily was, I mean, the fact that all three of us are now um, and were at the time uh, sort of remote work enthusiasts and um, participants. Uh, this was, of course, recorded uh, in the before time, uh, before coronavirus was a thing. And it's been really interesting, especially now to rewatch this and kind of see it in a new light. Anyway, so this is kind of just a cool conversation, a bit of a riff among three more veteran remote work folks in like remote organizations before it was cool or uh, legally mandated. So there's kind of a lot to dip into here, but it's, it's a good one. Three of us tend to work for, we do work for uh, very large remote organizations, all remote. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And uh, I think there's something, there's probably a thread to pull there. Yeah. How does, how is communication different? Or how much harder is it to build something like a data golden path when you can't run a in-person session once a month? Yeah, I mean, I am a big, big advocate uh, for remote work in a um, in a super like uh, universal way. I think um, it could be a source for good in the world. I think it could be a source of uh, increasing economic equality. Um, there's a lot of reasons I think to be really enthusiastic about remote work, um, and I am really enthusiastic about it. But I think there are a lot of um, I think there are a lot of advantages that you get for free in a co-located work environment that many times are invisible and overlooked when people move into the remote space. Um, and a lot of those are things that are not necessarily naturally valued by people who want to work for software companies. So things like um, having a best friend or like engaging in chit chat right? These things that come kind of naturally in a, in a co-located environment have to be like weirdly intentional in a remote environment, right? Like you have to say to somebody like, hey, we should both eat lunch at the same time, but like watch each other eat lunch. Like <laughs> we should do that on camera, you know? And that's, I, my voice even sounds creepy saying that, right? <laughs> it, 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 feels, it feels odd to ask that, but it wouldn't be weird at all if you were like, hey, let's get lunch today, right? Yeah. To someone in an office. And I think that- or it's such a challenge. Let's set up a calendar invite to eat lunch and watch each other doing it every six weeks. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and that that's just one example. I think there's many places and, and ways where we we sort of um, we lack those little invisible, especially social, but also professional mm, interactions. And we don't even notice they're gone. We just sort of notice, you know, a lot of folks report remote work feels really lonely, right? And I think that's part of it is these like invisible things you get for free in an office and you don't even really notice they're missing. You just notice that, you know, you feel kind of lonely <laughs> and um, it's hard. I have so many thoughts here <laughs> because it's something again that I am also super passionate about. Yeah. I actually have a blog post that will go up hopefully this week or next on this topic specifically. But in general, it's interesting for the three of us as remote only organizations to see what we have been intentional about building. And when I talk about remote work at Zapier, I talk very specifically about how we have a written documentation culture that would never have organically developed if you were co-located yeah. because you need to be able to serve people who might be in different time zones or communicate with people who uh, you just can't tap on the shoulder. And because of that, at 300 people, so I work for the smallest company of the three here, <laughs> at 300 people, we have more written documentation, I think, than a company of 1,000 that were co-located. Yeah. And so we're running into challenges now around organizational uh, knowledge and sort of institutional knowledge and how do you search for that? How do you know what information is in what tool? But the fact that it, all that information is there and accessible and you can go see why a decision was made two mm -hmm. years ago is crazy powerful. And so it's, we have made very intentional decisions to empower remote work in ways that I think transitioning a company would be much more difficult to try and build those habits later. Um, the other example that I think is fun of the material that Simon was talking about is in a role like mine that 
often is called chief of staff or something along those lines. A lot of the literature that you read will talk about sneaker net. You should just be able to walk around the office and talk to people and say, hey, what's on your mind? And so sneaker net at a remote organization for me literally means reaching out on Slack and saying, hey, I'd love to chat sometime and see how you're doing. But that feels much more formal mm -hmm. than tapping someone on the shoulder at lunch or something along those lines. And so I've had to think hard about how do you frame that conversation? How do you help people engage with you because my role is no one's boss. So it's not exactly a skip level. It's not a formal communication, but I am someone that they can talk to who has really broad context around the organization and can be super helpful for them. And so understanding how to frame that ask at a remote org has been a challenge. And I've been happy with the results when I've been able to do that. And it's actually something that I schedule regularly now, yeah. but I actually have to put it on my calendar of, Hey, let's go have three chats with random people around the org this week. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you could just do naturally as a leader at a co-located right. organization. If, yeah, if that's, that's right. And it's that, like, it feels like that forced intentionality. It just feels uh, a bit odd or a bit unnatural. And even like as a, even as a team lead, I, I find I will sometimes talk about human relationships in a way that I, I feel like I'm a, like an AI, like just trying to explore the organization sometimes. Like I've said to people on my team, like, that sounds like a really good idea. I think you should develop that relationship. Like you should talk to that person six more times. And just, <laughs> like see it in Slack is like, I feel like I'm not passing a Turing test or something. Like that. You know, it's, it, it's a really weird, it's very strange. Even now, like seven years in, I still feel odd sometimes thinking about it. Yeah, I, I, there are definitely trade-offs when it comes to remote work. Like I remember when I first, uh, like I was, I had just moved to a new city. I was working remotely full time, um, and my now husband was gone for a week. And I remember like three days in just having this thought of like, wow, I haven't spoken to anyone in person in three days. Yeah. And that's when I joined the gym and I've been going to the gym three to four days a week ever since in small group classes, because that's my like social interaction. Um, and that's what I need to do to be successful. And I think part of the transition to remote work um, is learning what those boundaries or bumpers for you are so that's one of them for me having coffee chats with my colleagues on a recurring basis and i send the calendar invite and just making a recurring invite every yeah. six weeks that's like the sweet spot for me of yeah. like if we need to interact more often for work we will but this is a good regular touch point twice a quarter um we have a, a really um I want to call it incredible, but I'm totally biased. Handbook at GitLab. I was going to call that out. Yeah, I was. Stephen was saying <laughs> the import of documentation. I was like, you know, I thought we were doing a good job on documentation <laughs> until I looked at GitLab's like handbook one time, and yeah. I've coveted yeah. it. I'm so covetous. It's it's really incredible. So about .gitlab slash handbook for anyone who wants to go see what that looks like. It's three thousand pages last I checked, but it's been a while since I checked, so that could be out of date. Um, but I think like I just took over certain parts of the board meeting process in my role and I didn't have to like spend a lot of time with the CFO to understand the process because it was all documented in the handbook and I could just kind of run with that and I had a clarifying question and then I updated the handbook so that the next time this happens I don't have that clarifying question again um, and I think that's like a, a really epitomizes like how great this is because the alternative is I would have needed what an hour at least of the CFO's time and right. now I didn't need that. And it, 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 I mean, it's very easy for me to see it as like marvelous from the outside, but it also seems to me uh, sort of having read through some of the data stuff specifically that a lot of what even remote organizations rely on organizational and institutional like know-how it's all sort of written out really intentionally in, in the GitLab handbook in a way that I think, especially for new people, must just be so nice. Um, we're still in the process of onboarding our latest person in, in some ways. And it's, there are so many moments that I will be, I'll be, I'll be speaking with her and I'll think, right, like I'm, all I'm doing is explaining to you something that I know just in virtue of having been here. 
And the fact that that's not somewhere for you to read and sort of ingest, like, is a problem. I, I just want to say, like, that still happens. <laughs> it, it still happens. It, it try as we might, because you never know what's not written down. Yeah, and yeah. someone goes to look for it, and they don't find the answer. Um, and so even after I moved out of the data team, there were things where people would come to me with a question. And rather than reply, I would then make the merge request, which is how we update the handbook and send them a link to the merge request and say, oh, like, nice. just answer your question. And if not, let me know and I'll, I'll make this MR better. Um, and that's actually kind of the story of the handbook and how it came to be. Our CEO, Sid C. Grandy says that, you know, people would ask him the question and he would respond and then people would ask it again and he doesn't want to repeat himself. So that's where the handbook came from. Um, and I think that that's true. And, and when that's the mindset, like I think about setting future Emily up for success a lot. And so I updated the handbook about the board meeting, not necessarily because the docs need to be better. I mean, they're mostly good now, but really I don't want to have to ask the question again next time. Right. And that's where like the handbook is an ever living, constantly changing document that um, has so much of how we run the company, but changes are incredibly fast. Like you can open an MR in the morning at the beginning of your day, 9 a.m., whatever time zone you're in. And at five o'clock, it might be 3,000 commits behind. Wow. So the handbook is changing so quickly. I wish I knew how many MRs get merged a day, but um, it's definitely something to keep up with. And one of the problems we're having now is like, how much knowledge do people have to know? And how do we make sure people are informed on the changes they need to be informed on? And uh, for a long time, I read the title of every merge request that got merged into the handbook. Wow. And then that wasn't sustainable anymore. So I read it only for the pages that were relevant to my interests. And then that's not sustainable anymore. And so twice a week now I skim the headlines. Yeah, yeah. And hope True. that I catch the things that I need to catch. Yeah, I'm jealous. Uh, I'm jealous of the, like just the culture of like a deep commitment to, I mean, really what it is is like sort of asynchronous communication, right? Totally. And, and I think, um, like when we think about a handbook or we think about a process like that, that's what we're really talking about, right? It's like how, sending messages to ourselves in the future. Yep. Um, the other piece of this that I think is super important to think about, but often is not, um, is I read a post that someone wrote about a 2X organization, which means if you're doubling every year, which a lot of hyper growth startups are doing or even faster, then the material that you're writing isn't even for the people at the company. It's for the people who are not at the company yet. Right. Because a year from now, half of the people at the company won't have been here when you wrote that thing. Wow. And it lets you be a lot more intentional about documentation and writing good notes and documenting decisions and all of that sort of thing. When you consider, I've now been at Zapier for two and a half years, 75% of the people at the company were not here when I wrote the first thing that I wrote to document. Wow. And so that material isn't for the people now, it's for all the people a year and two and three from now that can go back. And I am just so grateful to one of our first, I think our first data scientist who started at Zapier, I can go back and find material that he wrote three or four years ago that has some sort of cool conclusion that I don't have to go ask him about. I just can right. search for it in our async tool. We use a tool called async. It's our internal blog where we post results and things like that. Um, I can go look in async and find material that he published in 2016 before I started at the company and not have to rerun an experiment and not have to take his time now. So that's super powerful and one of the biggest opportunities, I think, for asynchronous communication like that. And I think yeah. a good place to start, like if you're thinking about how to build more of a culture around this, um, working in like issues or, or tickets and keeping those well documented, that's probably a good place to start. It's not yeah. a great organizational structure, but it can start building that culture of like writing things down. Why did you approach the problem this way? What was the outcome? Things like that. Our, something that, that has been kind of interesting to me that's happened or I guess has always been happening, but I'm only observing it now, is we have a pretty strong culture of asynchronous communication as well on sort of internal boards. You know, it's, it's a WordPress theme we use called V2. Um, 
but and, and for a long time, I think the assumption was, oh, like this is documentation, right? Like we're communicating in this way. It's searchable. Like okay, cool. Like, but but the problem is, there's so many. There's like two or three P twos per person in automatic now, uh, all for different projects and sort of different divisions or or whatever else. And what ends up happening is, you still need institutional knowledge in order to like effectively search that. So you have to be, know like. Oh, well, in 2016, the team that was working on domain recommendations was called Kraken. So I need to like (laughs) search on the P2s, you know, and it it becomes this sort of second order institutional knowledge, whereas sort of organizing it in a more intentional way, like as in the handbook, um, seems to me to be a better sort of end run around this sort of requirement. Yeah, I mean, even that gets hard though, right? Let's talk about the top KPIs for the company. Sales has some, marketing has some. The CEO has company-wide KPIs, product has KPIs. So where does that live? On a KPI page or on each of the functional groups? These are hard questions. And I don't think there's a right answer. I think there's like a, we're doing it this way for now. And if it doesn't work, we'll change. Yep. The pattern of this conversation pretty much is me saying, I think GitLab is great. And then Emily saying, "Eh, not so fast. No, I will say, I think GitLab is great. (laughs) Like, I... I really enjoy working at GitLab. I think it's awesome, but we're doing things in a different way. And I, yeah. like, people struggle with that when they transition is that like, it's hard and different and weird. Like, yeah, well, I appreciate it. I mean, any organization really that's kind of out there cause we're all sort of out there on the, on the edge of like what it means to be like doing work. And, and yep. I really kind of, as you know, as the, you know, I still have that 13 year old, like punk rock kid inside me. Right. Like I still, I like to think of being a little bit odd and a little bit sort of doing things in an unusual way. And like, sometimes that means it's not going to work. Right. But sometimes it does work and it works in really cool ways. 